Welcome to part three of our webinar series, Earth Observations Toolkit for Sustainable Cities and Human Settlements. The title of today's part is Use Cases from the National and City Level. And my name is Arjit Kavada from NASA Supply Sciences Program and also the Earth Observations for Sustainable Development Goals Initiative. The course information, the prerequisites. So we have three 90-minute sessions that have been part of this webinar series. The webinar recordings and PowerPoint presentations can be found on the training web page, and you see the link for that here. And also you can see the prerequisites that we had recommended that you access before uh, listening to this training. So those are also available through the links provided in this slide. There is one homework assignment as part of this uh, webinar series, and that homework assignment is now available on the trainings webpage. Answers to the homework assignment must be submitted via the Google Form access from the RCED website. And the, homework, uh, the homework's due date is February 24th, 2022. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all three live webinars and complete the exercise, complete the homework assignment by the due date of February 24th. And you will receive this certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course. And you can see the email address from where you're going to be receiving the certificate. By the end of this training, you will be able to understand the value and usefulness of Earth observations to monitor and report on urban sustainable development goal indicators in the new urban agenda. Learn from inspiring examples of cities using Earth observations for SDG 11 and the new urban agenda, and understand how to apply Earth observation-based toolkit resources to enhance them urban resilience and improve decisions regarding planning, monitoring, and operational preparedness. So today we are covering part three on use cases from the national and city level. And so I would like, it is, it is my pleasure to introduce now Sandra Liliana Moreno, who is the Technical Director of the Geostatistics Division at the National Administrative Department of Statistics, DANE, in Colombia. And Sandra will be talking to us today about how, in her office, they have used Earth observations to calculate SDG indicator 11.7.1 on access to open public spaces in Colombia. Sandra, welcome and over to you. Hi to everybody. It's a pleasure to me to be here. Thank you so much. My name is Sandra Liliana Moreno. Um, I am the technical director of Geostatistics Department at the National Administrative Department of Statistics in Colombia. Dan. So, um, in this three part of this webinar, we are first, I am going to present the use of air observation to calculate SDG indicator 11.7.1. So, this is the agenda of the presentation. First, we are, I am going to talk about the definition of the indicator, the air observation toolkit that we use, the methodology defined by UNAVITAS. And the process that was developed in DANI, and finally the results and the dissemination process uh, of this indicator. So, um, what, which is this indicator? The indicator 11.7.1 is the average of built-up areas of, fit of cities that is open, um, that is open space, uh, disaggregated by sex age and persons with disabilities. This indicator is um, related with the goal 11, that is sustainable cities and communities. It's important to mention that uh, the custodian agency for this indicator is UNAVITA. 
So, you know, it has developed the methodology to calculate this indicator. And the indicator is classified at level two, which means that the indicator is conceptually clear with established international methodology and standards is available. However, um, data are not regularly produced by countries. So it's a good, it's a good opportunity to know this methodology and improve the productions of calculation of these indicators in the countries. So we are the air observation toolkit for this indicator. Well, um, first, it's important to mention that the, in the web page of the air observation toolkit, in the use case section, is available time experience um, to calculate this indicator. Uh, you can visit this page and um, read more details about the methodology, the results, and in general, different experience um, that we have with this calculation of these indicators. This is a space to share experience, to know about the work of others, and to make um, alliance and knowledge sharing. Second, we also use Global Human Settlement Ledger. This is um, a free ledger that, that you can obtain. Uh, this is a ledger produced by, for a global initiative that gives information about build-up area, population density, and also information that we take into account in this process, that is the degree of urbanization, the GURBA, and local administrative units classified by the degree of urbanization. Um, so this global ledger is available, and uh, this is a source, this could be a source of information for this indicator. And also, um, we take into account the um, SDG, indic the, the, the curva, the URBA uh, methodology from Eurostat. This methodology uh, helps to classify or define cities, um, take into account different standards. So you use this methodology to identify which urban areas could be classified as cities in Colombia. Um, so uh, as I mentioned before, um, UNAVITAT is the custodian agency. And UNAVITAT provides a metadata and methodology that help us to calculate this uh, indicator. So this methodology could be um, is inc include three steps. The first step um, is the objective of the first step is to obtain the build-up area through imaging processing. So in this step, uh, the idea is to um, have access to satellite image classify the information, the pixels of the image, into build-up area, public space, and water, and later perform a cluster analysis that help us to obtain the final build-up area for the cities. The second step is the calculation of the public open space and roads. So, um, to to perform this, uh, this second step, the idea is to um, uh, collect different information from the national inventory, if this exists, or use satellite image for identify public space. Also, um, it's important to define roads by the topology and calculate the surface, the surface area. In the third um, step, um, is determining the percentage of um, which percentage of built up area built up area corresponds to public space. So this is the the main the main steps that we follow to calculate these indicators, take into account the methodology uh, provided by UNAMITA as um, a custodian agency. 
So, um, as a preliminary activities, it's important to mention that UNAVITAT recommends to um, generate a national samples of cities based on those that are defined by the Urbea methodology. So, um, UNAVITAT recommends to generate these uh, national samples of cities take into account that the indicator requires additional inputs that are not always available for all cities. So, take into account this recommendation. In DANE, we create or we design a proportional um, sample. We, we design a, a sample proportional to the population size of the capital cities. As a result, we obtain a sample of nine cities uh, in which we calculate the indicator 11.7.1. So in this table, you can see the, um, the nine cities of this sample. And in the map, you can see um, the location of the samples um, that is located mainly in the urban areas of the country, that is the central area and the, and the north of the country. So all the, the information, the indicator was calculated for these nine cities. Well, um, in this slide you can see the inputs that we use to calculate these indicators. First, we use optical satellite image, Sentinel-2. Um, these images are free, you can download free, so this is a good source of information to standardize the calculation for all the nine cities in Colombia. This silent image has a resolution of 10 meters. So we, we, this is the main input that, that we use um, about air observation. But also we use georeferenced statistical information. We take into account the national geostatistical framework that we have in Colombia that provide the, the information about the municipality townships in Colombia. And also we use the, the information from the national population census that was conducted in 2018 and give information. This census was is georeferenced. So it's an important sources of information that help to um, identify which are located the people and um, disaggregate by different groups of interest. It means women, children, um, persons with disability. Finally, we also use free sources of information. Uh, for, for our case, we use OpenStreetMap as a source of information that help to improve the identification of public space and roads. Um, also, it's important to mention that in the methodology proposed by UNAVITA, um, they recommend to calculate the accessibility that um, population groups of interest has to um, public space. It means that, um, according with the methodology, it's important to calculate the accessibility that people with, like women, children under 14, and people with disability has to the open space. Uh, according with the methodology uh, provided by UNAVITA, this uh, is important to calculate the service area. It means um, the service area are a polygon in which um, the people can arrive walking to this public space. So um, we also calculate this service area to identify which are the percentage of women, children, and people with disability has access to this open space in each city. So, taking into account that, um, in DANE, we work with this methodology, and as I mentioned before, 
the first step of the first preliminary act preliminary activity was um, calculate a sample of cities. Um, it means we identify which are the cities in Colombia, and later, according with this universe of cities in Colombia, we calculate the samples in which, uh, as a result, we identify nice cities um, to calculate in. Second, we define the urban area of each of city, so we identify the build-up area for these nine cities. To do that, we um, use Sentinel-2 satellite image of 2018. So with this information, the first step was calculate the public space. Uh, we, for calculate the public space, we use three sources of information. We use the um, the information of the geospatial framework in Colombia. We use also information about OpenStreetMap to identify public space. And um, we use the results of the satellite image. And also we take into account the cartography about blocks. And with this information about blocks, we can uh, calculate or estimate the uh, area for roads. So with these different sources of information, at the end, we calculate the global indicator. Um, we calculate two, uh, in, digamos, two information. First, we calculate the global indicators. That is me, that based on this um, formula, it means the, we calculate the indicator, take into account the percentage calculated by public space plus roads, um, take into account the total build-up area of the cities. This is the first indicators that we calculate in a global context, but also an uh, indicator for each of the nine cities of the sample. Second, we calculate the um, indicator disaggregate by children under 40 years, women and persons with disabilities. To do that, um, we calculate the service areas of public space where determined and with the census units of the national population census. So to do that, we take into account the total number of people of the population within service area, take into account or based on the total number of people of the population groups in urban area. So um, we take into account these two um, different indicators that help us to understand um, the indicator 11.7.1. So take into account that um, in this part of the slides, I am going to present the results that we obtain, take into account this methodology. So uh, in, this, in this slide, you can see the result for Medellin. This is one of the cities that uh, in which works um, for these indicators. Uh, in the first map, you can see the build-up area that was obtained by satellite, the processing of satellite image. Second rows that we obtained take into account um, the cartography information that we have and blocks. And third, public space that we obtain take into account the satellite image, but also open street maps. This is the result for Cali. Um, this is the other uh, Colombian city select in the sample. Bogota, um, this is the result for Bogota. Barranquilla, and this is the result that we obtained with all this information that we calculated previously. Um, we can calculate for each city the area of public space, taking into account the source of data. Open street maps, road, and um, your build up area. As a result, um, we identify that cities with the highest proportion of, of, of open public space in relation to their build up area are Pereira, Cali, and Medellin. And the cities with the lowest values are Cartagena, Barranquilla, and Turbaco. 
So this indicator um, helps to understand what is the proportion of open public space that each city has in relation with their developed area. With this information, we calculate the um, a global indicator from the indicator 11.7.1. Um, this is the first. This was the first step or the first result of this apply, to apply this methodology. But also, we if we calculate the service area 25, um, which was the accessibility to women, children, and persons with disability to this public space that each city has. So um, we, the service area was generated for each of the public space using network analyze and accessibility function. So you use um, GIS software to calculate the surface area taking into account network analysis, taking into account the roles for each um, city. And thanks to that, uh, you can see the, the service area for the different cities that we work, Medellin, Cali, Bogota, and Barranquilla. As a result of the calculation of this um, service area, we, um, we obtain this result that you can see in the, in the title. In general, um, the access to public space by the population groups of interest is similar for each of the cities. However, Bogota and Pereira stand out as cities with percentage above 90%, while Cartagena has percentage below 65%. So this is the results. Um, as I mentioned before, the accessibility between groups, women, children, and persons with disabilities is similar. However, Bogota and Pereira has um, the uh, more um, values of accessibility. So this is the national estimation. Um, with this sample of cities, we calculate a, a global or a national estimation, a national indicator. Uh, in general, we can see that um, for Colombia in the cities, 33% um, of the built-up areas correspond to open space uh, for public use. And understand that this open space, it means green areas and roads. Also, we uh, obtain as a result that 80% uh, of women have access to this public space, and the 77% of children under 14 years of age has access to this public, uh, public uh, space. And finally, persons with disabilities, the 84% of these persons with disability has access to this um, public space in, that are able, um, available in each city. So, um, with all these results, we started a dissemination process. Um, you can see that we, this is the link in which you can visit and, and read and to see the results in more detail. We produce a geo viewer in which you can see the result for each city or for each of the sample city in which we calculate the public space Villa area, service area, and also is available the documentation, presentation, and methodology that we use um, and for obtaining these results. So this is um, a good example about how the air observation, SARA image, georeference data um, could be processing in different um, spatial um, methods 
that help up help us to calculate the information in this case for the indicator 11.7.1 this information is very useful to understand how is organized the city in the countries and what is the accessibility that has population group of interest and what is the proportion of public space um, into the build up area of the cities so I invite you, finally, I invite you to visit these uh, different links and to um, read and, and visit uh, the experience and the methodology that we use. And if in our country, we, you don't know also, um, you don't know the information of the indicators, I invite you to calculate the information um, that is, if you have the information, it's, it's very easy to calculate. So thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Sandra. Next, you will hear from Evangelos Gerasopoulos, Research Director at the National Observatory of Athens and co-chair of the Group on Earth Observations Program Board, and his colleague, Jennifer Bailey, currently a PhD student at the University of California in San Diego. They will be talking to us about an Earth Observations Space tool that they have developed to monitor SDG indicator 11.6.2, on air quality, population weighted air quality in cities. Evangelos and Jennifer, thank you and over to you. Hello, I'm Evangelos Gerasopoulos, Research Director at the National Observatory of Athens and co-chair of the Group on Earth Observations Program Board. And with me, my colleague, Jennifer Bailey, currently a PhD student at the University of California, San Diego. Together, we were a part of the core group that coordinated a European research project on the use of Earth observation for smart cities. We are excited to discuss and demonstrate the platform created within our project, focusing on air quality in cities and how Earth observation can support monitoring and reporting of SDG indicator 11.6.2. So Jen, why is the focus on urban air quality timely and crucial? Thank you, Vangelos. It's a pleasure to be with everybody. Well, currently, cities are home to more than half of the world's population, and this number is projected to increase to almost 70% by 2050. While cities only occupy a small proportion of the Earth's surface, they account for a bulk of the world's emissions and consumption of resources. However, urban areas hold great potential for impact in terms of implementing effective emissions reduction measures improving public health, and building resilience through promoting sustainable urbanization as a variety of policy frameworks suggest through their urban focus. According to the World Health Organization, almost all the global population is exposed to levels of air pollution that put them at increased risk for diseases and mortality, also estimating that exposure to fine particulate matter causes 4.2 million premature deaths per year. Fine particulate matter, or PM2.5, are particles with a diameter of 2.5 microns or less, are inhaled and can deeply penetrate lungs, resulting in both short and long-term impacts, such as respiratory and cardiovascular disease and mortality, increase in hospital admissions and lung cancer, along with impacts on mental health and overall well-being. Because of the strong evidence linking particulate matter and negative health outcomes, PM2.5 is a common proxy indicator for air pollution. While there is no threshold identified below which no damage to health is observed, there are international and national guidelines put in place to limit exposure to particulate matter and protect public health. The World Health Organization suggests a new much lower annual average at just five micrograms per cubic meter while the EU and US Environmental Protection Agency thresholds allow for higher annual concentrations of PM 2.5. So as Evangelos explained, exposure to particulate matter is a global problem, often accentuated in the urban environment, where an ever-growing number of people are exposed to harmful levels of pollution. The UN has identified urban air quality as an indicator to measure progress towards achieving Sustainable Development Goal 11. 
specifically through monitoring and reporting on fine particulate matter in cities. While the indicator is defined according to city level concentrations of PM, it is aggregated and reported at the national level with one number reported per country. With all of this in mind, what is the definition of a city? Urban areas of the world come in different sizes and densities and are determined based on varying national criteria that does not allow for comparison across countries. In an effort to address this, the European Commission, OECD, World Bank, and others are actively putting forth a global people-based definition of cities and settlements, and the methodology has been endorsed by the UN Statistical Commission. This harmonized approach to defining cities is known as the degree of urbanization, or DEGERBA, and can support frames such as the Sustainable Development Goals and the New Urban Agenda, which include indicators that are sensitive to how a city is delineated. Our project, entitled SMURBS, or the Smart Urban Solutions for Air Quality Disasters and City Growth, which was funded by EU's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program, promotes the smart city concept through the integration of Earth observation, serving the need for a common approach to enhance environmental and societal resilience to specific urban pressures. Within SMERBS, we created an online platform which uses state-of-the-art Earth observation data from the Copernicus services and the global human settlement layer to create an application for delivering the indicator on a per-city basis, looking at the two linked definitions, the degree of urbanization, particularly the urban center, and the functional urban areas. In comparison with other approaches, such as the UN approach using cities reported per country and the Eurostat approach using agglomeration, the online platform helps to illustrate the sensitivity of indicator 11.6.2 to city definition and offers a portal for national stakeholders to better perceive the ensuing policy implications, enabling comparison of air quality among cities, as well as identification of urban areas acting as hotspots that drive the national indicator value. So, Jen, what is the difference between an urban center and a functional urban area? An urban center combines built-up information and population data from the global human settlement layer, which uses satellite imagery, modeling, and population data from censuses, and defines an urban center from required conditions that constitute high-density clusters using a uniform one kilometer squared grid. An urban center includes contiguous grid cells of at least 50,000 total population, with either a population density of at least 1,500 inhabitants per kilometer squared or density of built up area greater than 50% per kilometer squared. The second city definition that we utilized in the SMERBS 11.6.2 platform is the EU OECD defined functional urban area. This city definition is also an extension of the degree of urbanization methodology using the same uniform one kilometer squared grid. However, the functional urban area definition takes the urban center a step further by assigning local administrative units to define cities and then also adding the commuting zone of each city. The SMERT platform allows for analysis of particulate matter concentrations over time across Europe, as well as country and city concentrations using the Copernicus Atmospheric Modeling Service estimation of PN 2.5 values. This is then overlaid by either the Global Human Settlement Layer for the urban center definition or the Copernicus Land Monitoring Services Urban Atlas delineations for population and city boundaries according to the functional urban area city definition. For each country in Europe, the national indicator value of population weighted PM values according to both city definition is calculated usually using the algorithm shown, resulting in a functional knowledge platform with city level information. To show you what this actually looks like in practice and the functionality of the platform, we will now quickly take you through a short demonstration. So, thank you, Bangalore. You can find, easily find the platform by Googling or um, using the link that we've included in our slide.
once you get to the platform, you can see the different components. There's a map and there's charts. Um, you can also look for more information in the hamburger menu on the left-hand side. We've included tons of information here about SMURB's project, our approach to calculating indicator 1162, the um, different city definitions and how the indicator is sensitive to how a city is delineated, as well as some information on the EU and WHO guidelines um, and providing some information for the user to help you kind of get acquainted with the platform. I'll briefly take you through the walkthrough, um, which kind of introduces each component of the platform, where you can see the map is highlighted here. This will show um, each city value for the indicator, as well as the country values in Europe, based off of the different city definitions that you select. So whether it's functional urban area or urban center, you also need to select a year to display the data. And there's some functionality where you can show and hide country layers and play with um, the opacity of the map. On the left-hand side, you have um, the different tables which display the data set for um, the city or the country. And you can also add those to this chart at the bottom, which kind of allows for a time series look at um, the indicator value for different countries and cities. So you can add different cities or countries to this map, compare them, see how they kind of measure up to other countries in Europe, um, and also to the WHO guideline and the EU standard. There's also the option to look at the capitals of Europe and then do a specific city comparison. And then as I mentioned, you can find more information in this menu in the top left. So now I will kind of take you through um, two different quick examples to show you how to use the platform. First, I'll select functional urban area as the city definition I wanna look at. And I'll select a year and it will populate the map and the chart. So you can see this background color is the national value and then each functional urban area is kind of outlined here and assigned a color as well according to um, its population and PM 2.5 concentration. Focusing here on Italy, when looking at the entire country, you can see that there are these um, red functional urban areas in the north of the country kind of hotspot cities that may be influencing the national indicator value. Um, as you can see in the south, the functional urban areas are green and yellow. So um, up in the north, which is expected because it is an industrial area, you have these hotspot cities like Milan, for example. So you can either add Milan to the map or this comparison chart in the bottom left by selecting on the map, or you can come in here and type the city or the country that you wanna to add to the chart. Once you select it, it also zooms in to that functional urban area on the map, which is nice. You can add it to the chart and kind of see here how it measures up with the EU standard here. Um, you can see in 2015, 16, it was right at that standard. You can also um, deselect. So here we have in the purple, Europe is shown as a country. Um, you can deselect that if you want to just look at these Italian values. And then also moving south, you can add Rome um, to the chart as well. And you can see that Rome has much lower concentrations, much lower indicator value for SDG 11.62. So this kind of shows you that you can use the platform to identify hotspot areas and sort of cities that are driving, maybe driving the national indicator value. So you can clear contents of the chart. And I will show you one more example looking at the other city definitions. So now selecting urban center, I'll look at the same year 
and let it populate the map. So moving north, so looking at Poland, you can see that the urban centers are much smaller, which makes sense because the functional urban area incorporates that commuting zone. But um, you can see it's red, so very high value for the country, as well as a lot of the urban centers are red or some orange, a couple of green or yellows. And you can select and add to the, the chart in the bottom left as you wish. But even so, you can zoom out and look at larger trends. So you can see with all of Europe, sort of a north-south and east-west gradient looking at these, this indicator value of particulate matter concentrations with population. Um, but it really helps you see trends and um, sort of compare and look at how things change when you change the definition of a city and how um, they compare in terms of cities and countries. So that was just a brief run through. I will hand it back to you, Van Gogh, to wrap up our discussion. Thank you, Jen. As we've shown, this platform provides a horizontal and comparable approach for all cities and countries, going beyond the indicator value by actually producing annual averages on the city level, and thereby giving countries a means to respond to the UN fundamental principle of official statistics request for disaggregation of indicators by geographic location. This platform can help fill this gap and give a data visualization tool for national stakeholders to implement targeted mitigation measures aimed at lowering concentrations, minimizing population exposure, and achieving SDG 11, all by bridging together freely available and high quality data from the Earth Observation based Copernicus and Global Home and Settlement Services with smart city methods. I want to thank you all for your time today. On behalf of myself and Jennifer, please feel free to reach out to either of us via email, and we look forward to answering your questions during the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Evangelos and Jennifer. Our third use case today will be presented by Nalenzani Modu, a remote sensing scientist at the South African National Space Agency, and it is a case study on the computation of indicator 11.3.1, which uh, calculates the ratio of land consumption rate per population growth rate. Nale, thank you, and over to you. Thank you, Aji, for the introduction. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ngarezani Modau. I'm a remote sensing scientist at the South African National Space Agency. And I'll be presenting a case study that we have done uh, on the computation of the national SDG indicator 11.3.1, which looks at the ratio of land consumption rate to population growth rate. Um, as you, you have learned by now um, during the training, during the previous sessions, we have um, 17 sustainable development goals, of which one of the goals is SDG goal number 11, which looks at making cities, human settlements, uh, in inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainability, I mean sustainable. There are a number of targets and indicators um, under this SDG goal, and uh, my presentation will be based on um, indicator 11.3.1, um, which measures uh, the ratio of land consumption rate to population growth rate. Uh, maybe just to include that, um, this case study was conducted in conjunction or in partnership with the UN uh, Habitat. So if we look at um, the indicator, this indicator measures land use efficiency. This is the measurement that tells us how the cities uh, or the countries are utilizing the urban land. 
So we are assessing the rate of urban development or developments in urban areas against a population growth rate. Ideally, the land consumption uh, or urban development should be lower than the population growth. Uh, this will mean that we have um, lower rates of uh, urban ex expansion or um, uh, lower rates of urban development compared to population growth. The computation of this indicator is done at a city level, but it is required to be reported at a national level. There is a um, approved formula that is used to compute this indicator, which um, is indicated by ratio of LCR PGR, which is a short for land consumption rate to population growth rate. So to compute these indicators, you need information on urban extent or build up for two date stamps and also the population information for the corresponding day. Um, more information about this indicator can be found. There's a metadata document that exists uh, and below the slide is the URL that you can use to access the indicate uh, the metadata document, which gives more detail in terms of how this indicator should be computed. To compute this indicator, two data or information sources are required. Um, one is information on the population, and the other information is information on the um, urban extent, boundary, or build-up area. So population data is normally sourced from the national statistical offices and uh, through the information that is captured uh, during censuses. There are also other sources of, um, of population data uh, which are graded uh, uh, to different skills, such as the World Pop, the GPW, the GHS Pop, amongst others. And then in terms of urban extent or boundaries, um, uh, the source of this information is satellite images. So they are available a number of um, open access satellite images, such as Landsat and the Sentinel. In addition to open access images, we also have access to um, human segment data or build up data that, that, that is already developed from satellite images. So these include the global human sediment layer, GHSL, the world sediment foot, foot, uh, footprint. So these are some of the data sets that are already available and approved um, for use uh, during the computation of this um, indicator. The reporting of this indicator is um, dependent on the in terms of the time frame, the time frame is dependent on the availability of the data and also the special resolution of the input, input data that is required. So depending on the availability of the data, especially the population data and also the, the build-up information, depending on the resolution, this um, indicator can, can be computed annually every five years or 10 years. So we'll go straight to the um, indicator or the case study that we, we computed for South Africa. So as I indicated earlier, the indicator is computed at a city level, but is re uh, reported at a national level. So we used a, a method called national sample of cities to compute this indicator. So this method uh, called the National um, Sample of Cities or the National Sample of Cities um, is a representative sample of cities that take into account the regional or sub-regional or city-specific characteristics. So it helps to create weighted national averages for uh, specific indicators like um, the one that we are talking about, which is uh, indicator 11.3.1. 
This uh, method helps in areas where we have limited resources in terms of finances, for example, to get information at a national level or over all the cities that are available in a country. So it can it helps then to to select some cities that can then be re regularly monitored, and they can also be used to to, to monitor other indicators that are required to be uh, computed at a city level but reported at a national level. So more information can be found um, on the URL that are provided in the bottom of the slide. This method was developed by the UN Habitat. So the, the graph or the workflow that is indicated um, on the slide shows all the processes that are followed to identify the sample cities and uh, up to reporting um, that indicator at a national level. So for South Africa, what we did, we identified all the cities, um, urban areas, and towns. So this method also allows the, the countries and the users then to also include um, other towns that if um, we follow in particular definitions, maybe they may be left out, which will be of significance to um, that particular indicator, but also the country. So we used um, our national database of, of cities, towns, and urban areas and other available databases like the citypopulation.de to, um, to identify all the urban areas in the country. So after identifying them, we use to, we group them according to the population and also according to the sub-regional or provincial or province where they belong. Um, so, in, in South Africa, we have about nine, nine uh, provinces, and, and those were used to then group the selection to make sure that the cities and urban areas are represent or are spread um, in an even manner across the country so that the figure that we get is a representative of what is happening in the country. So after um, uh, identifying them and grouping them, um, the cities and the urban areas, we um, selected the sample cities randomly um, to make sure or making sure that the cities that we select are representative of the population and the geographic location in terms of administrative boundary of where they belong. So that also then um, was followed by then determining how much weight each city will have during the computation. So if you're looking, for example, at cities with less than um, 100,000 people, so we made sure that um, whatever city that we selected was a representative of um, the cities in that particular province or sub-region. So that, that also, if in a region we have so many um, cities that falls within that fall within that category, it will mean that the weight of that particular city will be higher than in areas where we have few cities um, that are represented. So after that, we computed the, the indicator uh, based on those selected uh, cities. And then we generated the so the the values that we get in terms of the indicator when we are looking at the the cities that we selected it then gets um, weighed according to or recalculated according to the weight that it it has in terms of how many city cities it's representing against the total population in urban area in urban areas. So from there, then um, the national um, average of that indicator is calculated through weighing um, the individual values that we received when we assess the cities. So um, looking at the cities and urban areas 
we have about 219 uh, cities, towns, and urban areas um, in, in South Africa. So those were categorized according to populations uh, from the cities or towns with less than 100,000 uh, people to the cities with more than 5 million people. So the slide just shows um, the list of the cities uh, that fall within the different population categories. And the last column shows the total number of um, people that are represented uh, or that live in urban areas. So after applying the national um, uh, sample of cities, we then selected about 30 cities um, and uh, in terms of the number of cities that are represented in terms of population, they are all listed on the, on the slide. For example, for the cities which, um, which with less than 100,000 people, um, we had about nine cities. We selected about nine cities because that was um, the, in fact, majority of the cities or urban areas had um, less than 100,000 uh, uh, people. So the same applied also with the 100 and 250. We had the same number. So this shows that many of our urban areas then fall within um, 250 and, and less than 100,000 in terms of population. So these are small populations, and I mean, population. And then if you look at um, cities with uh, more than 1 million, these are the cities, um, these are the major cities, um, what we call metropolitan cities. So if we look at those, we are looking at about eight um, in the country. So the selection included the four, as much as some of the, uh, the municipal boundaries might fall within one or two of the ones that are indicated here. So if we look at the total population, um, that is represented by the selected cities, we are looking at about um, 21.5 million people. Um, so this slide shows the spatial distribution of the cities that were assessed and their corresponding uh, population information and also the weight that was allocated to these cities, depending on how many cities uh, fell into the same category that um, that we used. For example, for one city called Ginubi represented in in a in that category where it falls, that is in a category of population of less than hundred and in a category of um, um, the region or province where it's Eastern Cape, that particular city uh, weighed, was representing 21 cities or urban areas. So then uh, if we look at the last column indicated there, it represents the weight that was allocated to that particular uh, city. So um, data sources, we, we used the census information or census data to derive uh, population information or to uh, get the population information. Uh, so for South Africa, we have census data for 1996, 2001, and 2011. This was sourced from the national office uh, that is responsible for censuses. And then urban extent or build up areas were, um, were sourced from spot five satellite imagery captured in 2011, spot two and four satellite images captured in 20, 2001, Landsat images um, uh, from Landsat five captured in 1996. So these slides illustrate the methodology that we used for build-up extraction. For spot five, we used a method that we develop in collaboration with the JRC, which automatically detects 
um, build up areas from spot five images. More information about this method can also be found on the link that is provided. And for the uh, build up extraction from spot two, four, and Landsat five, we used um, object based in, um, analysis uh, in terms of classifying build up areas uh, from non build up areas. The details of the methodology is also available on, on, on the publication that we, 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 we did or developed, uh, which is also, the paper is also indicated on the bottom or in the bottom of the slide. So the methodology that we used also included um, extracting or, or mapping urban extent from the build up area. I am aware that the, the revised method now um, does not require this particular um, uh, step to be done. Um, the analysis can be done using build up area. So for us, when we did the study, we used urban extent um, for the uh, computation and that required us to compute uh, or, to, or to determine the urbanness of the build up pixels according to the walking distance as indicated on this um, slide. So the, methodolo the methodology was developed by Angel and Al in 2016 and more information on the methodology can also be found on, on their paper. But otherwise, uh, it entails mapping from the build up pixels, it entails mapping urban, suburban and also rural pixels especially in the areas where we have um, metropolitan cities that ex extend beyond just the core or the urban area. Because, for example, in South Africa, we, we don't necessarily have urban extent or city extent, especially in the big or in the major um, um, cities because we use what we call more metropolitan um, uh, areas, which include agricultural and other open areas. So this is the methodology that we used and more information can be found on the paper. So if we look at the, the, the results, um, focusing on the build up area mapping, um, we can, this particular slide shows some of the developments in the cities that we assessed. Um, so we can see the build up area in 1996 presented in the gray color, and then the red color representing the developments in 2001, yellow representing development in, in 2011. So we can see if you look at the, the center of, or the CBDs which are located in the center of the city, we can see that uh, from 20, between 1996 and 2011, the growth has been taking place a lot, I mean, mostly in the outskirts of, of the cities. Um, this information, when it's captured in this way, as much as yes, yes, it can be used for reporting the indicator, but it also gives the authority um, authorities a lot of information in terms of um, what is um, with the development taking place and whether that the rate and where the development is taking place is um, where it should be taking place. Because then if we are experiencing a lot of expansion, it means that um, there's a lot of infrastructure resources that will be required. For example, if one looks at transport. Um, so moving on, um, if we look at an example of um, urban extent mapping, so what we're looking at here is Rustinbeck, where we are able to see the urban extent in the years of assessment. Um, that is 1996-2001 and um, 2011. So as indicated earlier, to compute this indicator, we need um, to assess urban growth rate or land consumption rate. 
and also the population growth rate. So this graph shows the urban population uh, growth rate over 1996 to 20, 2001 period and also 2001 to 2011 period. So we can see that if, if you zoom in or if you know the, the areas, the metropolitan cities, these are the major cities and the smaller towns, um, they experience a lot of um, expansion or land consumption um, or higher consumption rate or urban growth over the 1996 to 2001 um, period. This could be related to uh, the political situation around that period, uh, which um, enable people to move to, to the cities uh, than the, in the previous years or pre-1996 or 94. Um, and also, if we look at the, um, the later period, which is 2001 to 2011, we've we found that secondary cities, what we call secondary cities or areas with population less than 500,000, but more than 250, these areas, they experience higher urban growth rate compared to other areas. So this will be the likes of um, um, Rustinburg, uh, Bulugwane, uh, middle bag amongst others. So this is the trend that we are able to to observe uh, or pick up by assessing the urban growth of the cities. And then if we look at the population growth rate of this the cities, we find that um, the urban areas and cities with less than 250,000 uh, people experience higher population growth rates uh, than the metropolitan cities or, or the secondary cities during the 1996 period and the 2001. And then uh, during, the, during the, the 2001 to 2011, we see that cities with I mean, with population between 250,000 to 500,000 experience higher population growth rate um, compared to the metropolitan cities and other small cities. If we look at the major cities um, like Johannesburg, Cape Town, Pretoria, Tswan, and Deben, we find that uh, Deben or Etequini is uh, experiencing the lowest population growth between uh, all the periods that, or the two periods that we assessed compared to the other metropolitan cities. So after computing the urban growth and or the urban areas, um, and also calculating the population within the cities, we then computed the ratio, I mean the indicator, um, that is indicator 11.3.1, which is the ratio of land consumption rate to population growth rate. So if we look at, at, at the results, so these are the results that we are seeing. So the figures on the, on the left represent the land consumption, the ratio of the land consumption rate of the cities. So we can see that between um, the two periods uh, that we assessed, most of the cities had um, a, land a ratio of land consumption rate to population uh, growth rate of less than one, um, which is ideal because more than one means that um, we have more or higher urban expansion rate compared to population growth rate. However, if we look at some of the metropolitan cities like Port Elizabeth and, and um, East London, those two experienced a higher ratio between 1996 and 2001. But overall, we can see that um, between the two periods from 96 to 2001, 
than 2001 to 2011, almost all the cities experience a decline in terms of the ratio, um, except for two cities, Harry Smith and Pochestro. So this indicates that there is an improvement in terms of um, land use, meaning that there is um, some degree of um, a higher land use efficiency in terms of a comparing or comparison of urban growth uh, versus uh, population growth. So after um, calculating the, the ratios for the cities, we then weighted the, 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 the values of the individual cities depending on the weight that was allocated to the um, to that particular city during the sampling or during the selection of the cities that were assessed. So um, the figure that we got after weighing the ratio of the individual cities for South Africa is that in 1996 to, uh, to, to 2001, the ratio was 0 0.809. And then 2001, 2011, the ratio came down to 0 0.5359, almost 0 0.4. So meaning that um, there has been some improvement um, uh, in terms of land use, meaning that um, the urban expansion is lower than the, the population growth rate. But assessing these cities or this indicator at a city level also allows then um, the users or authorities to look at individual city or a group if there's any trend within a group of um, cities that fall within the same category in terms of population and also the, the province where they belong. So the authorities will be able to go in and see if there are any measures that they need to put in place to ensure that um, the land is used, urban land is used in a sustainable manner. Um, so in addition to the indicator 3, 11.3.1, um, which we computed, we also computed uh, build up area per capita or land, consum uh, land consumption per capita. So uh, this, this indicator looks at or what we're calling a sub-indicator, it, it looks at the space um, each person occupies within a city at a given time in square meters. So if we look at um, the figures from 1996, 2001 to 2011, we can see that the build-up area per capita has been slightly declining um, for the cities that were assessed. This means that um, these cities, um, um, because they are experiencing a decline in the build up area per capita, it means that there's a possibility that they are experiencing densification. Of course, um, this could be an indicator in terms of land use efficiency, but it, um, one must also look at the type of development because if it's informal settlements that are being um, established in, in some of these urban areas, then um, the build-up area per capita might not necessarily be showing efficiency. So in conclusion, um, our study indicated that um, South Africa has been uh, experiencing a decline on the ratio at least looking at the periods that we assessed and the decline is showing that there is some there is an improve or is an indicator of improved improved land use efficiency um, the analysis of the results if we look at the individual towns also shows that the smaller urban areas are experiencing higher uh, ratios of land consumption rate to population growth uh, compared to major cities. 
Um, this shows then the need for authorities to also focus on the or to 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 manage the development within this or in the small cities as much of the effort a lot of effort is put on the major cities so during this case study uh, we also computed a number of um, sub indicators or information that can be used as sub indicators to, that can help um, authority better authorities to better understand uh, what is happening in their um, areas, especially if we're looking at land consumption. So this include the land consumption per capita or build up um, per capita, and also um, other indicators such as urban extent. They were also measured because when you are are uh, using the method that we use already this information is generated you, we were also able to assess land consumed during the period uh, the two periods that we we assess so these are additional information um this is additional information that can be used to 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 enhance or to improve um decision making in in the urban areas or in the cities so the method that we use in terms of uh, selecting sample cities that represent that are representative of, of the country, it can also it pro, it provides us with um, a, a, um, capability to then also uh, assess other indicators like access to green and public spaces, access to public transport, and other. SDG goal indicators relating to poverty, health, um, amongst others, and energy inequality and climate change. So this allows us to go back and um, uh, evaluate or assess the same cities against um, you know other indicators. Then we will be able to compare uh, in terms of what is happening in in a country when we focusing on those particular indicators that require information to be acquired at a city level, but to, um, the reporting being done on the national level. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Nale. Here you can find the email contact information for myself and the presenters from today's session. You can also find out more and access the training webpage as well as the NASA RCID webpage in the links provided in the slide. We also invite you to follow us on Twitter at NASA RCID and also at EO for SDG, where you can find out more information about ongoing activities, upcoming trainings, and other events of relevance to earth science applications and research. So during this three-part webinar series, we reviewed how Earth observations contribute to advancing monitoring and reporting on sustainable development goals with a focus on SDG 11 and the new urban agenda. We also addressed the Earth Observations Toolkit for Sustainable Cities and Human Settlements and looked at some of the background and resources that are part of this online knowledge resource. In part two of the webinar series, we reviewed some of the tools and data products that are part of this uh, online resource and can be used to inform some of the uh, SDG 11 related indicators. And in part three uh, of to from today's session, we listened from national and city level representatives about three use cases of how they have applied Earth observations to inform SDG 11 indicators at uh, their national and city level. So we hope that this uh, um, information and use cases can help you assess how you may be able to use these tools and data sets to see how they can help you continue to advance the sustainable development goals at your organization, city, or country level. So thank you very much, and we'll move uh, on to the Q&A session now. Thank you.
Wonderful. Thank you again. And so we're going to share now a document where we have uh, combined some of the questions and we've started providing answers to your questions here. And we will do our best to cover all of the questions today. If uh, we don't get to some of them, we'll make sure to answer them and then share them with you. Uh, in a timely manner. Also, please note in the chat uh, that um, we have created a survey and so we invite you to complete that survey to collect information uh, in regards to, to this uh, training and some additional questions. So, uh, let's move over to question one. How do you account for the road area considering this is usually represented linearly? And so we have an answer here in terms of that the process uh, was made possible by taking the area of influence that is given by the track width. In Colombia, the track width average in the urban areas is 3.5 meters per lane. Uh, Carlos, Sandra, does, do you, would you like to add to this response? Uh, thank you, RG. Uh, no, uh, only we uh, like to include the uh, uh, we're using always the information about the area of influence uh, that is given by the track uh, white. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to question two. Can this methodology work for other indicators at the city level or is it just for SDG 11? For example, water bodies. So this methodology is focused on cities. The classification of water is done in a general way to avoid adding these areas to the built up area. Uh, is there somebody on the panel that would like to add to this response? Let's move on then to question three. Sentinel-2 satellite images have 30 meter resolution that is 32.8 feet below 32.8 feet width roads can't be identified on the images. In my city, a lot of roads and streets are within the 32.8 feet range. How to calculate the roads area then? Sandra, could I, Sandra and perhaps Nale, would one of you like to address that? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, we, uh, to do this process, uh, uh, we have to do the identification of the road area uh, using a uh, Sentinel-2 uh, satellite images. And also uh, we include the information from the vector type uh, source, uh, such as the limit of the census block uh, from the National Geostatistical Framework from Colombia. We use this information uh, to do our uh, cartography from the census. Uh, we use uh, this information, uh, specific information of the block boundaries to help to detail uh, the overall ranking from the satellite images. And we can define uh, this information and this area in the, in the project. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. So is there any article that we could reference regarding the methodology and all the steps involved so I could apply them to my study area? So we have included the links here and I know that our colleagues at DANE, the National Statistics Office of Colombia, do provide this information, so the methodology file and access to also the indicator results uh, via GeoViewer through Dana's page. This is currently provided in Spanish. You can also, however, access the use case uh, and details on how this is done on the workflow through the EO toolkit by looking at use cases and the particular use case from Colombia. And perhaps if I, I pause here and, and or perhaps instead of pausing, I will note that in a similar fashion, the use case from um, South Africa, but we heard about is also available in um, in the EU toolkit uh, web you? portal. Yes, Sandra, please go ahead. Excuse me, I like to complement the, the last yes. answer because uh, we have all the information in Spanish. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, in the EO toolkit portal, uh, we include our contact information. And if anybody have a specific question about our project, uh, you can send us an email uh, to respond uh, about your specific uh, question. And thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. I appreciate that. The following question in the Dane example, as far as I understand, the information is focusing on physical accessibility of public areas. Is there any way enhancing the use of this method to also gain insights on qualitative assessment of the public space? For example, safety differentiation between part of the public space reserved for vehicles and part available for pedestrian use. Which set of data or additional data collection would this require? Let's go back to you, Sandra. Uh, thank you, Argy. Uh, yes, uh, the, the, methods, uh, the methods used to determine accessibility, uh, such as the recommended value and habitat for this indicator, uh, focus on general metrics of accessibility. Uh, for example, areas around public spaces that are within a defined distance using a particular transport method. Uh, in the case of the 11.7.1 SDG indicator, the criterion used is uh, the access to less than 400 meters walking. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Sandra. Let's go to the following question. If we scroll down a bit, uh, so question number six. This question still fits today. Maybe it is suited better in previous sessions. To what degree are applications, monitoring, mapping, etc., of urban ecosystem services, ecosystem-based adaptation measures, implemented in the EU toolkit for sustainable cities at the current state. Do you plan to bring these tools into the toolkit? And so I will start and, and then I would like to ask others perhaps in the panel to complement or share their thoughts on this. So currently the toolkit shares data products, tools and use cases that are particularly relevant for SDG 11 indicators. So looking at the uh, cities and, and broader human settlements. We are, however, within the group on, on Earth Observations community, we are having discussions, A, around developing additional toolkit for other sustainable development goals. And in fact, currently there is a risk toolkit that is under development. And we're also discussing and looking at how we can develop connections and what we call bridges between these CO toolkits. Uh, for integration purposes. So, for example, looking at aspects that pertain to urban ecosystem services and also making connections, for instance, between um, city uh, relevant or urban and human settlement relevant disasters uh, and then connecting that to what we currently have in the toolkit, like, for example, looking at flood monitoring in cities. So, this is not currently the case but we are hoping to be able to build on and, and share and showcase these connections. And also we're hoping to have other toolkits that will become available. Is there anybody else on the panel that would like to add to this? Arjun, if I may. Please. Yes, sorry, inspired from the Observatory of Athens. Uh, the toolkit may not have uh, explicit tools for example, uh, ecosystem services. But in order to do urban ecosystem accounting, you do need the, the base layers that you can find in the toolkit. So uh, it's not a direct uh, support, but an indirect support. I would put it, I would frame it like this. Just a small Thank comment you. from my side. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Wonderful. So let's move on to question seven. How do I calculate the built up? land footprint of a particular city. Can you please provide a link where the calculation is easy to understand step by step? And so here I want to invite um, 
perhaps I can also invite our colleague Nale from uh, South Africa, a space agency, to, to offer some insights there, as well as our colleagues from Colombia, from Dane. Uh, thank you, Arji. Can I start? Yes, please. Thank you, Nale. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dane currently has available the general um, materials associated with the calculation of the indicator on our web uh, page. We include the link in the document. Uh, however, uh, to determine the urban, uh, urban footprint, uh, we use supervised and unsupervised image classification methods using machine learning techniques. Uh, we can share uh, this information too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. Um, Aji, if I may add. Please, Nale. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yes, build up um, extraction uh, from satellite imagery is it's not an, an easy task. Uh, because we we have roofs with different um, roofing material, so I think as indicated uh, in the presentation, there there are a few methods that we use to derive build up area from satellite imagery, and that would include um, object based and also uh, supervised um, classification um, techniques, including machine learning. So. Um, I think what is important is to to look at the type of uh, uh, settlements that you have in a particular area, and and then determine or investigate what will be the best methodology to extract build up area in 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 the particular in that particular area. But I think uh, we from the toolkit you will be able to get information on the methods that are used, especially if you're looking at um, um, extraction from Landsat, amongst others, where we can easily determine the impervious surfaces and um, uh, from other areas. But from high resolution imagery also, there, there are some methods that have been um, shared um, on the presentation that I, I, I made earlier. But otherwise, I think um, from the toolkit, uh, the participants can also have access to um, some of the specialists or people who have conducted the studies who will be able to support and share more information and, if possible, maybe even collaborate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nale. Thank you, Sandra. And as an additional note, uh, please uh, take a look. We've also included a training module that UN Habitat has uh, uh, put together, for example, on indicator 11.3.1 on sustainable urbanization. And I will note that in the toolkit, there are a number of data sets that help estimate build up area. I've, uh, inclu we've included some of those there. And we are also currently working to develop some step-by-step -step guidance. So taking what the UN Habitat has put together in the training module, we are working with UN Habitat uh, and partners to develop this step-by-step -step guidance um, and make that part of the toolkit that will help make it even more uh, simplified in terms of the workflow. But I do invite you to look at the examples shared today and also reach out to the colleagues if you have questions. The next and, and last question perhaps for today, given that we're a little bit over time, I have been finding it very difficult to extract satellite images of any area or region in my country using Google Earth Engine. Is there any other alternative source to obtaining satellite images? Absolutely. Um, I will say that um, I, I see that uh, Brack has included a number of uh, um, access points where you can access openly and, and, and download data. And so there are certainly places like the Socioeconomic Data Application Center um, of NASA um, that provides access to a number of data sets. There are specific access points that our colleagues in Europe 
at the uh, Joint Research Center as well as uh, uh, through the Copernicus uh, uh, Services Program. So there are a number of links that have been provided there. Also, I'd invite you to take a look at the tools that we have uh, uh, we've made part of this toolkit resource. And so these tools are primarily um, online um, tools that you can leverage, uh, open tools and online that you can leverage to, in many cases, more easily find, access, and then analyze um, Earth observation data. And so you can filter the tools by the indicator of interest or the specific topic of interest, as well as the geographic level, spatial, temporal resolution. And so um, that may help you as well in addressing this, this challenge. And lastly, I will note that we would like to hear from you, especially if your organization, if you're um, working on these topics and you'd like to find out how you can be using more some of the data sets and potentially leveraging available tools to um, uh, compute indicators and address uh, some uh, of these issues that pertain to sustainable urbanization for at your city level uh, or municipality level, we would like to hear from you and see how we can uh, collaborate. So feel free to, to reach out uh, and let us know. So with that, uh, we will conclude today's uh, training. And this concludes the three-part series of the training session. Quick reminders to please uh, um, also uh, complete the homework assignment. And again, the videos and all the training material will, will be made available after today's third uh, part of the training as well, or access after this, this webinar. Thank you very much.